Uh, all right, so welcome to uh, things that cause respiratory bacteria that cause respiratory infections and related organisms. And um, as I did in the last lecture, I have a bunch of stars on about half the slides. Uh, those are the ones to pay attention to when you're studying and make sure you know uh, what's in it. And I'll kind of try and emphasize things. The first thing I wanna emphasize is that pneumonia is often led by uh, common cold symptoms due to an upper respiratory infection, an earache, uh, et cetera, which, which essentially causes the bacteria to go down deeper to cause a deep-seated uh, infection in your lungs that is life-threatening. Um, all right, let's, let's always, okay, I always have a clicking problem. Let's see how it goes on. Um, okay, here is my list of content objectives that you, uh, I'm not gonna read through, but I will solve one question here with where we're talking about chemotherapy. Um, basically broad, almost all of these respond to broad spectrum antibiotic therapy. Most antibiotics work for them. Uh, what you need to know for certain things is the organisms that are resistant to certain drugs by some important characteristics of them. So don't ask me if we have to know, you know, what kills this and that. What you have to know really in most cases is what doesn't kill them. You can make an, an assumption that erythromycin, penicillin, macrolides, et cetera, um, tetracyclines are effective for most things unless I tell you they're not. All right, that said, not my favorite. Uh, that said, okay, um, next slide. I'm, okay, uh, that said, we are going to be talking about uh, bacterial lung infections. Uh, and the most common one is strep pneumonia. I will hear much more about that. And then these are less common, but certainly common in the population. Uh, we're also gonna hear a little bit about how a pathogen and a bacteria emerges and we get a new infectious disease or we think we're seeing a new infectious disease. This, and we'll have another example of that in our, my next lecture on zoonotics. Um, and then we'll talk about some less severe pneumonias and finally about mycoplasma and chlamydia. Okay, so let's begin with what pneumonia is like. Okay, here's a typical case of an 85 year old person from Newark, uh, basically suffered a cold that became severe. And then he shows up in the emergency room breathing very quickly, which is what happens. That's the reaction when your PO2 uh, goes down below 90, you start breathing quickly, rapid, it's called dyspnea, very fast breathing. Um, you have a fever, showed fever and a fast pulse. This is all a reaction to the fact that your blood isn't being properly oxygenated. So the heart beats faster so you can get more blood through into your uh, lungs to be oxygenated. Um, physical exam revealed congestion in right lower lobe. Okay, confirmed by chest x-ray. Uh, this is done by tapping on the tapping on the chest. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. And then we you tap and, and you get evidence, you go for an x-ray and you confirm that. And finally, some blood cultures or now PCR um, of that. And uh, you look for a bacteria that you know is not a normal flora that actually causes the symptoms. In this case, we have a positive symptom for strep pneumonia and the patient got hospitalized, treated with antibiotics. But like is fairly common for somebody who's 85 years old, um, uh, they die, okay? Because pneumonia in an old person, as you all know, during this COVID uh, pandemic uh, is not a very good thing and it 
is highly lethal uh, problem. Pneumonias are with us and have been with us way before COVID, okay? They were, for, until this year, the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. That's before COVID. Uh, we're in those, there used to be about 25 deaths per 100,000 people. And you realize that for every 100,000 people, there are about 1,000 deaths, okay? Just so you do uh, a, a calculation. Uh, so about 70,000 people would die of pneumonia per year. Now, obviously, with if we count COVID, we're already up to 600,000. Okay, so uh, you can see the effect, but we're not gonna be talking about COVID today because we're gonna be talking about bacterial pneumonias. And as you can see, most of the people who die are old people, okay? Now that's true in the United States because where if a kid gets pneumonia and it's a bacterial pneumonia, we can treat them with antibiotics, but in universally in places where we don't have modern medicine, uh, we get 4 billion people under the age of five who die annually, okay? Uh, this is not true in industrialized nation. Most of the cases we see that cause death are viral pneumonias because we can treat most bacterial pneumonias in kids, but not all. Um, whereas in non-industrialized nations, uh, most of the pediatric pneumonias that uh, essentially are lethal are bacterial pneumonias and there's no, uh, no um, uh, availability of, ease of antibiotics necessarily, depending on where it takes place. Now, pneumonias under, have this classification, and I don't expect you to remember that, but very often if you're reading about pneumonia in a, uh, in a textbook, you'll see them, so you don't get confused. All that means is that if you see cat pneumonia, you're dealing with clinically acquired pneumonia. If you're dealing with HAP pneumonia, you're dealing with hospital acquired pneumonia. Uh, most of it is clinically acquired pneumonia, and that's basically divided into bacterial, viral, and fungal etiologies that cause it, okay? Whereas hospital acquired can either come from the fact that you had a contaminated ventilator, which is quite common, um, or, uh, healthcare associated pneumonia, where some other aspect or some healthcare worker uh, essentially gives it to you, or the bed's contaminated, or the air is contaminated. Obviously, uh, with COVID, what we've seen is closing off of the infectious disease wards because um, this airborne infection, uh, it was the best way to prevent people bringing into uh, with visitors or taking out. Uh, the, the COVID. So uh, isolation is very important and uh, dealing with that has become very important. But to, you don't have to really remember these other than to see, know that if you see them, all it, all it really means is where you got it from. So when we talk about pneumonia, we're talking about a lower respiratory infection involving the bronchioles, which are below the bronchi, which are the main air pathways, this is where they branch off into bronchioles and then ultimately the alveoli, which are the air exchanging uh, part of the lungs where the blood capillaries essentially line them and you exchange, uh, blood becomes oxygenated in them. So when you get pneumonia, you essentially, uh, due to that bacterial infection, uh, just like we've heard for COVID, you undergo a cytokine storm or uh, the, the level of which is highly dependent upon uh, genetics and, and, and how old you are. Uh, but th that's what that ultimately brings on is mucus production, migration of neutrophils and macrophages. Um, but that mucus production and the introduction of fluid into the lungs and the swelling that goes on there essentially, and the cytokines make you feel terrible, okay? That's called malaise, okay? Uh, the shortness of breath is due to the fact that your 
lungs are not getting oxygenated uh, normally because there's crap in them. There's fluid and, and mucus and cells in there and, and, and swelling, okay? You're coughing uh, because your airways very often uh, are also inflamed. Uh, you have fever from that cytokine storm, uh, as I mentioned, fluid, and uh, an abnormal chest x-ray. And if it's really severe, you can notice a bluing of your fingertips due to the fact that uh, oxygenated blood isn't getting that out there. Now, before we had x-rays, we've had pneumonia, okay? People have been having pneumonia uh, as long as we have the word pneumo and pneumonia. Uh, before that, I don't know what they called it, but uh, we've always had pneumonia and people have been able to diagnose it for hundreds of years. And they do that via uh, a, a technique called percussion, percussion the lungs. Um, and this is a wonderful video. If you end up going to medical school uh, or nursing school, at some point you're gonna learn about percussing the lungs. And this is a wonderful instructional video by this very talented uh, old line cl clinician who tells you about the different sounds as you percuss the chest, as you make the, the your chest a drum. Um, now, anybody, now one of the, my uh, diagnostic for having a good cl diagnostic clinician is whether that clinician is able to find the stud in a wall. Because as you know, when you hit the wall, tap on the wall, uh, you hear a hollow sound until you reach a stud in the wall, and then all of a sudden it doesn't become a, a hollow sound. And in the same way, lungs, when you breathe in, lungs are filled with air, and there's a hollow sound, okay? But if somebody, and now I'm going up to where that chest X-ray is, has that effusion into the lungs, all of a sudden it's going to sound like it's filled and it's gonna have a solid sound. So this is what, that a good diagnostician um, will use a chest X-ray, but in fact can tell pretty much in advance what that X-ray is gonna look like uh, via those sounds. In addition, uh, there's something called auscultation, which is the sounds that you hear through a stethoscope. And when you have pneumonia, uh, it's likely you're going to hear rails or crackles uh, and ronchi, which is a wheezing sound, or strider, which is a whistling sound. These are all uh, differential sounds made in different parts of the lung depending and the airways, depending on what's connected. So you can learn an awful lot without doing an x-ray, but nevertheless, uh, x-rays are still carried out uh, because they are much more precise than this. But on the other hand, on a quick physical exam, uh, these things turn out to be uh, essential and an important part. So when we have pneumonia, okay, um, if we, we know that pneumonia and its mortality is very much a function of age. And this is in the United States in a developed country. And what you can see is that having pneumonia um, early on is pretty benign. Very few people die of, of it. And the people who die of it are usually immunocompromised to some extent or have one of the pre-existing conditions that we've heard that enable you to get a vaccine. And as you get older, um, you essentially go into a position, and this is obviously true with COVID, statistics aren't all that different for COVID, uh, but you can see that all of a sudden, by the time you're, you're in your 70s and 80s, that lethality of having a, a pneumonia uh, shoots up there, okay? Um, but let's first start talking about childhood pneumonia, okay? Um, this is an interesting thing that happens. So in before a kid is two, okay, um, in general, about two-thirds of pneumonias that we see are viral, and about a third to a little bit more are bacterial, and this is mostly due to two things, two factors. Um, one is mom provides a 
large amount of the immunity that a child sees during his first year uh, via uh, donating a lot of antibodies to that baby. And in, in addition, um, during the first two years of life, kids don't have too many play dates. They're mostly um, uh, sitting in a carriage or a, a walker, et cetera, and they don't socialize very much. Then starting at around two years old, when kids go into daycare, they go into the playground, they're walking, they're socializing, all of a sudden we see a flip in the statistics where 70% of the pneumonias we see are bacterial and only 30% are viral. Uh, part of that is a lot of kids have actually seen RSV at this point and become immune to it. Most of them don't get sick from it and they develop a natural immunity. And, um, you know, basically viral pneumonias just aren't that common and their own immune system is able to deal with most of them assume, assuming they're immunocompromised. Uh, sorry, immunocompetent. Okay, that said, um, let's look, this lecture is about bacterial pneumonias. Let's look at the bacteria that cause pneumonia that we're going to talk about in this lecture. Okay, and they are listed on this slide. I'm not going to read the slides, but this is a great slide to study for because it contains the name of a bacteria, sort of the relative level of pneumonias that they cause based on the size of the font here, and a couple of words of essential facts that you should know about each of these organisms. Okay, that said, uh, this will enable you to answer most of the questions that I might ask, okay? Uh, now, this doesn't include all the pneumonia-causing organisms. Uh, two others are shown on this slide. And um, this tells you a little bit about mortality, again, an average mortality of these uh, different bacteria that were mostly on the other slide. Uh, with few exceptions, I'll point out. And what we see is that the most common pneumonias, strep and what used to be haemophilus and mycoplasma, okay, what you see is that they represent uh, basically 95% or so of all pneumonias, okay? And what you can see is that the lethality, the mortality of them isn't that high. Okay, and that's because these are in fact non-opportunistic infections. Anybody can get sick from them and our immune systems can generally handle them. So the mortality is not so high. Okay, on the other hand, uh, we now get to staph, which we won't cover today, but Klebsiella, which we will, Pseudomonas, which we'll cover, and E. coli. Now, pneumonias due to any of these four organisms are actually quite rare, and that's because they are all strictly opportunistic infections. So the people who are likely to get them are pretty much people with crippled immune systems, and as a result, mortality of them goes way up because uh, they can't deal with their immune system is why they got a pneumonia in the first place. Um, and you'll hear more about these as we go on, okay? Now, one of the things that we've learned recently is PCR tests. Now, virtually, as I told you in the last lecture, almost all pneumonias are, and, and bacterial infections are now most quickly diagnosed, essentially taking some infective material um, and putting it through a multiplex PCR reaction, testing for about 95 different bacteria all at the same time, uh, doing a multiplex gel, uh, gel system that lights up different colors in different parts of the gel, very clever uh, mechanism, analyzing the ribosomal RNA sequences of these bacteria. And uh, what we've learned is that many pneumonias actually are poly infections due to polymicrobial infections. We find more than a single bacteria that is present. Now, in the old days, we still think, and, and most likely there's one very bad organism that's doing most of the infection. But on the other hand, if we treat that one organism and the other ones 
that might be also involved in the infection isn't dying uh, uh, that at the same time with the same antibiotic, uh, that infection may come out and actually cause mortality or morbidity for further morbidity of that aspect of it. So there's a lot more. This is a new finding about uh, uh, multiple infections, and uh, we're now, um, you know, basically learning more about dealing with. But again, broad spectrum antibiotics are going to kill most of the bacteria there, with the exceptions I'm going to tell you about. All right. So how do we get pneumonia? Okay, what makes us get pneumonia? Okay. By the way, another thing is is that these organisms here are very commonly found as sort of pseudo normal flora. Uh, they are present asymptomatically in a, a, a minority of the population. So they're floating around uh, within the air. Okay, that said, okay, how do you get pneumonia? Most pneumonias are due to the fact that uh, you get inoculated by infected secretions, droplet infections from somebody who is spreading it, whether or not they're infected they have an active uh, pathogenic infection or not is, uh, we don't really know in all cases if they're sneezing and they have a little bit of infection, that's an airborne pathogen. The cells basically adhere to the oropharynx and very often there's some kind of colonization, as I said, that gives you a little bit of a sore throat or nothing at all, or an earache, for example. Um, and ultimately, all of the upper respiratory system is connected to our lungs. So we aspire it, we breathe it into our lungs. And in most cases, our immune system is easily able to handle that aspiration uh, of the bacteria into the lung. On the other hand, if that bacteria gets lodged in and is able to escape the normal lung defect defenses, the pet, both passive an active immune system, uh, basically you can get recolonization and growth of that organism within the lungs. These are very often quick growing organisms that essentially cause that cytokine storm that clinically produce that pneumonia, okay? Um, in addition, on certain cases and for certain organisms, uh, Basically, you can breathe spores for some of them directly into the lungs, or they can essentially not colonize the oropharynx, but just land there and end up being breathed in. Or uh, in certain cases, we uh, aspire, uh, we actually cough up, especially in older people, uh, uh, gastric secretions that are contaminated with things like E. coli or something else that the person ate. Uh, and those end up getting aspired, uh, breathed into the lungs, uh, where they can then essentially grow and cause an infection. So predisposition conditions for lung infections, okay, uh, can be due to the fact that alcoholics, uh, people who uh, have very bad, uh, don't brush their teeth, don't gargle, uh, uh, if they're undergoing antibiotics, their uh, bacterial flora of the mouth might change, allowing for new bacteria to colonize. Um, we all have cilia in our uh, trachea that essentially move stuff out of there. And, and if the ciliary motion is uh, messed up due to some drugs or trauma, um, uh, that can in fact prevent the removal, the natural removal by these cilia that essentially beat upwards and push things up uh, to, to through the epiglottis where we then cough them out. So uh, that can happen. Uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, some pre-existing uh, obstructions in your lungs or airways. Uh, there are some genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis, asthma, that also restrict the passage, the free passage of air in and out of the lungs with the associated bacteria, okay? Um, 
with respect to, and most important is an immune deficiency, okay, of neutrophils or alveolar macrophages that enable the quick uh, entrance of these uh, things into our lungs, into our alveoli, where they quickly soak up the organisms, they, they opsonize them, and the macrophages swallow them up before they can grow. Uh, so an immune deficiency, both uh, with the, uh, the induced immune system as well as the passive immune system can also predispose you to pneumonia. All right, with that said, let us begin to talk about the various organisms that cause pneumonia. Okay. The most important bacterial cause of pneumonia, bacterial cause, is strep pneumonia. Strep pneumonia, or pneumococcus, is thought to cause 60 to 70 percent of all bacterial pneumonias. Okay. And even viral pneumonias like flu are very often the lethality that we see in a case of flu. Um, and I haven't seen any statistics for COVID, so I'm not going to say anything about it, uh, are very often due to a secondary infection of strep pneumonia or pneumococcus that comes in. Okay, now pneumococcus or strep pneumonia, very important, is a gram positive encapsulated, okay, it's got that polysaccharide capsule that I spoke about on the outer layer. Diplococcus, diplococci, shown here, okay, and here we see gram positive diplococci, okay, it is a strep, so we do see short chains, but generally we see them in pairs, as shown here. So it is a gram-positive diplococci that is alpha hemolytic. When you grow it on blood agar, it grows with this green halo due to the uh, chemical modification of the hemoglobe, of the hemin that's in a blood agar plate, shown here, as opposed to beta hemolytic uh, on blood agar, which is a complete lysis of those blood cells that are present on the blood agar plate. So this is alpha hemolytic, beta hemolytic, and this is gamma hemolytic or non-hemolytic. There's no hemolysis here. Again, gram positive encapsulated diplococci that's alpha hemolytic, and finally, sensitive to optogen. Optogen is an antibiotic, it's a uh, quinine derivative. It's an old fashioned, we don't use it anymore um, because we have far better antibiotics. But this quinine derivative uh, was, is used to differentiate pneumococcus from other kinds of strep because it's the only pneumococcus that's sensitive to optogen. Again, this quinine derivative. Um, okay. And Treatment of penicillin is with, of, of strep is virtually with any antibiotic. Um, in fact, penicillin or moxicillin works great. Erythromycin, a, aka ZPAC, Azithromax, which is a ZPAC, also works great. Um, they're quite sensitive to most antibiotics. Nevertheless, we do have plenty of strains that are resistant to penicillin or moxicillin, and there's uh, somewhat less, but still resistance to macrolides. So we always have fluoroquins and we have other, all those antibiotics that, that you've already heard about that are largely effective for penicillin. Now, what's great for old people like myself uh, is that we now have really nice vaccines that uh, are quite effective against strep pneumonia. Uh, one is Prevnar 13 and the other is Pneumovax 23. And Prevnar 13 is polysaccharide uh, coat. Remember, it is an encapsulated bug. So we can make antibodies using uh, that capsule and we can be inoculated with that capsule or polysaccharide. And there are 
13 different serotypes of that capsule that are uh, combined uh, in this Prevnar uh, vaccine. And this Prevnar, by the way, is a, uh, where we conjugate those polysaccharides. It's not something you really need to memorize, but, but we actually conjugate that, those 13 different polysaccharides made by the 13 different uh, path, by 13 different pathogenic strains, and there are more, but we take these common 13 different path, uh, pathogenic strains, we isolate the, um, the polysaccharide capsule, and we couple it to, I think it's a diphtheria protein. Uh, um, uh, yeah, it's a diphtheria protein, and it makes a very, very good vaccine against those strains. And and if you're over 65, you get a shot of this. And then a year later, you get a shot of Pneumovax. And Pneumovax is just a mixture of 23 different polysaccharide capsules coming from 23 different strains. So that pretty much after a year, first you're inoculated this, which takes care of most of them. And then you take an inoculation of the remaining ones a year later. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure. They give one of these to kids. I can't remember what which one is given to kids at the moment, but kids usually get just one or the other. Okay, that said, um, I just want to remind you again, strep is a alpha hemolytic gram positive encapsulated diplococcus that's optogen sensitive. And don't forget, very important, do not mix this up with this organism which is called Diplodocus, okay? Which is a big dinosaur, okay? Just don't do that. All right. What we just learned about is what's defined as a typical pneumonia, okay? What we're going to be talking about the rest of the lecture are what we refer to as less typical or atypical bacterial pneumonias. Again, 70% of them, of the pneumonias we see that are due to bacteria are pneumococcus, okay? So what about these less typical bacteria? The first one you've heard of before from Dr. Parveen, who taught, about, who taught you a little bit about CNS infection, and that's Haemophilus influenzae, okay? Now, Haemophilus influenzae was first sort of worked on and kind of characterized during the 1918 flu epidemic 103 years ago, where people thought that this might be the cause of the flu that they were seeing of the Spanish flu that they were seeing uh, at the time. Of course, it is a cause of pneumonia, but it wasn't causing the, Span the 1918 flu epidemic. And there's one particular strain uh, from serotype B that's very often referred to as Haemophilus influenza type B or Hib that causes most of the problem. All right. And Hib and, and the serotypes are due to a capsule. It's also encapsulated. And that capsule is called phosphoribocyl phosphate. We don't have to worry about the structure of that for this lecture, okay? But you'll hear about PRP. And what you should know is that it's an encapsulated gram-negative bacteria that causes it, okay? Encapsulated gram-negative bacteria, okay? And that it was once a huge problem in kids under five years old, okay? Huge problem with pediatric pneumonias. But now that we have a vaccine that is made up of this capsular polysaccharide, uh, we've essentially wiped out uh, Haemophilus influenza pneumonia from pediatric cases, okay? Um, since adults aren't uh, inoculated, it we do see some cases of uh, of uh, Hib infection in adults. There's been a slight increase in recent years. I think that mostly has to do with the fact that people grow older, and, and as a result, and and the age uh, of people increases the average age. So we have a slightly more uh, a susceptible population based on numbers of old people. Um, but again, you get this via droplet infection from somebody who's infected, and it's still not a problem because the, 
the vaccine takes care of most of it. So adults aren't gonna get it from their kids because the kids are vaccinated uh, in most cases. Again, we literally eliminated this as a major problem. Okay, now, nevertheless, since we do see it on, on, on adults and, and we do see it in CNS infection, we need to know that this bug does not grow on normal blood agar, but it grows very nicely on chocolate agar, which as I told you in the first lecture is simply made with boiled blood, tryptocase and soy agar, uh, as I told you earlier. What we also know, and this is one of the ways which we know, because lots of organisms don't grow on blood, but they do grow on chocolate agar. Uh, one of the ways that we easily diagnose and identify this organism is that if we take blood agar and add a little factor five, otherwise known as NAD nicotinamide, nicotinamide adenine diphosphate, or and a little hemin, otherwise known as factor 10, to those blood agar plates, that combination enables Haemophilus influenza to grow on a blood agar plate. Okay, so here we see this gram negative cacobacillus, sort of looks like E. coli in the microscope based on its gram stain, okay, it, except it is encapsulated, E. coli is not, okay, and, it, and here you can see that gram negative cacobacillus growing within a, looks like a, uh, um, a lung aspirate shown here. Okay. Uh, treatment, okay. Uh, what we use to treat Haemophilus now mostly is augmentin, which is a combination of a, a penicillin like amoxicillin and a beta lactamase inhibitor called clavulanate that you've probably already heard of that inhibits any penicillin resistant enzyme in this, which uh, some of these strains are indeed. Uh, resistant to penicillin. So we add a little beta-lactamase inhibitor to our uh, penicillin and uh, augmentin turns out to be a reasonable antibiotic to use, cephalosporins and macrolides. Again, also fluoroquins, also uh, uh, macrolides, also tetracyclines, okay? Um, these are respond to broad spectrum antibiotics in most cases. All right, that's all I wanna say about Haemophilus. And now I'm going to move on to Moraxella cataralis. Okay, now Moraxella cataralis is, as the name implied, comes from a catarrh, which is another name for a cold that makes you cough, a catarrh. I have a catarrh in my nose, okay? And it's named after the uh, microbiologist, uh, uh, Victor Morax, a German microbiologist from the early microbe hunters uh, that I've told you about before. And Morax basically uh, found this organism in a case of conjunctivitis. So it can cause other things besides a lung infection. Um, and Morax cataralis is a gram negative diplococcus. Okay, shown here. Here we see a gram negative. Diplococcus grown, blown up here in this slide, you see Diplococcus. And when Morax discovered this organism, he initially called it Neisseria. Okay, why did he call it Neisseria? He called it Neisseria because it was a gram negative Diplococcus. And, uh, and that's what people used to call gram negative Diplococci. They were all sort of thought to be Neisseria. So it got named Ni Neisseria. When we learn more about it, uh, we learn that it is common with Neisseria in the sense that it produces cytochrome oxidase. So it's called uh, oxidase positive, um, uh, just the way Neisseria is. Uh, but people realized in the 70s uh, that it wasn't Neisseria. So they named it after they decided to change their name, the name to Branhamella, okay, uh, which they did. Uh, and it turns out that Moraxella is considered a commensal because it's present in about 
in kids, maybe, tw and, and really old people, maybe up to 20% of the population actually harbor it as a non, uh, a, a non uh, symptom producing uh, a commensal. Uh, and as a result, you can get, uh, you can infect somebody if you cough this out. But interestingly enough, uh, if you are susceptible to it, um, and you're, you don't have antibodies to it, you might get an upper respiratory infection. And in fact, it turns out to be the most, uh, third most frequent cause of, of an earache, as we can see here. Okay, it can also cause sinusitis, laryngitis, typical upper respiratory infection, uh, can cause bronchitis, especially in smokers. Uh, again, you don't have to really remember these facts. What I want you to remember is it can cause a lung infection, uh, that it is a gram-negative diplococcus that is often found asymptomatically as a commensal organism, okay? The other thing you need to know is like Neisseria, it's oxidase or cytochrome oxidase positive, and you can see this is simply a colorimetric substrate for cytochrome oxidase that turns purple when you throw the substrate directly on a, col on a colony or pick a colony up on a Q-tip and, and uh, soak that Q-tip in that colorimetric substrate, it turns blue, as we can see. Nevertheless, now we can much more quickly find this, doesn't require too much growth, uh, requires no growth, will we essentially do PCR on the swab, looking for 95, 94 other organisms, and uh, we can see it grow up on a swab, okay? And if we do culture it, as I told you before, we can also do a mass spec analysis on the cultured organism, and it gives a specific fingerprint, okay? Treatment, this is another one that's important, okay? We can't use penicillin on it. Why? Or amoxicillin. And the reason is, is 80% or 90% of the isolates have now picked up a plasmid that, that renders it uh, resistant to both penicillin and vancomycin. Okay. Um, it does respond to augmentin. So if you inhibit the beta lactamase, it does respond. But Zithromax, cephalosporins all work on it. Okay. So Again, all you really need to remember uh, is that you don't want to use penicillin on it. That's the most important thing. Okay, that is all I want to say about Moraxella catarrhalis. Okay, and now we're going to move on to a story that I find very interesting about how bacteria emerge. Okay, and we call this a Philadelphia story. Okay, why do I call this a Philadelphia story? Because you'll hear in a minute. But for those of you who need, want to watch two excellent movies, one is the Philadelphia story shown here, which is a great comedy with uh, Cary Grant, Catherine Hepburn, and Jimmy Stewart. Okay, and I highly recommend it. Great, great movie. Real, uh, uh, I. Oscar worthy performance of Katherine Hepper, one of her best and one of the funniest movies. And then there's the more serious uh, movie with starring Tom Hanks and Denzel Washington uh, with uh, directed by Jonathan Dem uh, about uh, Philadelphia and the early parts of the AIDS epidemic. That said, I'm going to tell you the Philadelphia story that took place in 1976 at the, the 200th anniversary of our country, when the American Legion met in, at that point, the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. Um, this is now the Hyatt Bellevue. Okay, it's a downtown beautiful landmark Bose Arts Hotel, uh, very fancy. And basically what happened is a thousand guys, and look at the year, a thousand guys most from the American Legion, most of them World War II veterans, most of them above 65, go up, register into this hotel, and 
about one in five get sick. 34 ultimately die uh, So uh, within a couple of weeks. And all of a sudden you take a history, what's going on? Well, I went to an American Legion convention and a week later I got sick, you hear that. And all of a sudden the CDC goes to work and they say, what is the cause of this cluster? This is how we very often find uh, diseases and, and, and new diseases. Because if, you, if these occur sporadically, which is as you're gonna hear, uh, the major way we actually do see Legionella uh, or Legionnaire's disease named after the fact that it came from that American Legion convention, what we normally see is a sporadic case. Uh, which would never have gotten picked up and nobody would have done the legwork to figure out the cause of it. But now all of a sudden you had 200 people sick, 34 die, and all of a sudden the CDC goes into full-scale operation and it got known as Legionnaire's disease. Now I said this is a Philadelphia story, but since the discovery of the cause of Legionnaire's disease, we see other cases. So for example, uh, in the Bronx, uh, we found uh, recently uh, a, bun a cluster uh, that was associated with an air conditioning system in this hotel. And you could see a bunch of cases in lower in, in the Bronx where they were all spread out. Uh, people who essentially got aerosols from a building air conditioner as it turned out. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this infection ended up being due to contaminated water and a contaminated water supply, both in the water as well as in the building's air conditioning system, okay? Which is a clue to one of the reasons why we didn't see much of this disease in the old days, because before 1976, air conditioning, most of you don't remember this, you weren't born, but in the, uh, in, in this days, not every building was air conditioned. You couldn't assume that a building was air conditioned. But by the 70s, all of a sudden, buildings became air conditioned. And now all of a sudden, we have this new cluster of a new disease. Okay, and all of these people who got it in the Bronx, so it's no longer a Bronx tale, it's still called Legion, Legion, Legionnaires, but we had 124 people who were treated. Okay, most of them live, but a, a bunch of the old ones, uh, people who were aged, uh, ended up or had underlying conditions were also succumbed to this fairly lethal diseases. And we also hear all of these stories almost every year. We have a story of a seventh patient has Legionnaire's disease, cooling towers, eyed in Legionnaire's outbreak in Manhattan, Legionella found in Long Island school districts, all of these in the air conditioning systems uh, that are on during the summers. Okay, now the reality is, is nowadays when we see Legionnaire's disease, we see a sporadic case that looks much more like this, a 75 year old guy in a hot tub who smoked a lot, he's 75 and a smoker still, 10 day history of feeling lousy with fever that he did what most people would do when they feel lousy and, uh, and, and have a fever, they go to bed and they take some Tylenol to deal with the fever. Anyway, doesn't go away, they get heavy breathing, a rapid pulse fever, start coughing, and they go to the doctor or the emergency room and a physical exam reveals congestion in the lower left lobe, confirmed by chest x-ray. Now here is the scoop, okay? And this is why it was a disease that wasn't found for many years. I mean, we started getting air conditioning by the mid 60s, okay? Even by, by the mid 70s, most buildings were actually air conditioned, but here's why it wasn't found. Sputum cultures on blood agar and McConkie agar, okay? And chocolate agar for that matter, were all negative, okay? Now, in those days, when you essentially cultured a, a pneumonia and you didn't get a culture, um, you essentially real thought and brought up the possibility that the person had a viral pneumonia, okay? Viral pneumonias are not, were not treatable. They're not, uh, they're still, as you can see with COVID, uh, 
There, we don't have any magic bullets like antibiotics that really treat viral pneumonia. We treat the symptoms, okay? So here was this bacterial pneumonia that on most of the ways we saw those could analyze those, vi those bacterial pneumonia, uh, we didn't see any, any colonies come up. So basically uh, patients were essentially treated for their symptoms. In this case, uh, it's a newer case. So the patient was hospitalized and giving, given erythromycin and rifampin, okay, which are good for this organism, not, nothing you have to remember, uh, but his condition worsened and he's, he died, okay? And they did a PCR test of the hot tub water at his home, and it turned out to be positive for Legionella. Okay, so now we know how he got it. It is Legionnaire's disease is caused by a Legionella pneumophila. Okay, it is a severe pneumonia uh, incubation period, anywhere from two to 10 days, and it has a high mortality. Uh, amongst people who show extreme uh, symptoms, okay, who are, and all of these people are immunocompromised. If you're not immunocompromised, you're going to get better from this, okay, just like for most viral pneumonias, okay. Um, in the U.S., uh, it looks like there are only a thousand cases per year, but in fact, we think it's at least 10 times higher because these go unreported. Okay, people basically get them, they get better, okay? And as I mentioned, sporadic cases are rarely recognized, okay? And it's considered an opportunistic infection, okay? And heavy smoking, steroid treatment, which lowers your immune response, age, all indicative, okay? So was this disease ever seen earlier than 1976? And the answer is, is yes. So this turns out to be the more typical case of pneumonia. How many of you have ever seen a 1968 Pontiac GTO? Okay, can see your hands, raise your hands if you've ever seen it. Uh, Catherine Hernandez, do you have a question or is, that, is your hand up from, because I haven't looked at the board for a minute. Guess not, okay. So this is a 1968 Pontiac GTO. And I wanna point out, I'm showing this aside from it being probably one of the coolest American cars ever produced. Uh, there's even a song about it called Little GTO, a, uh, done by the Beach Boys and other cover groups. Okay, not originally done by the Beach Boys, great song, you can listen to it. But Pontiac Fever, which is why I'm showing you this Pontiac GTO, is a non-mnemonic febrile illness that's not life-threatening, okay? As it turned out, after they discovered the cause of Legionnaire's disease, they went and they saw that it came from air conditioning systems. They went back to, and it turns out that this infection, this cluster of infection, turned out to be in the Department of Health at, in Pontiac, Michigan. So it was right where people were interested in infectious diseases. And they basically discovered, uh, and they saved some of the water and they saved the blood from people who were infected by this, because basically a bunch of people uh, all working in the same building got this uh, disease and being a health clinic, they essentially took blood from them and froze it away. And they had some, air conditioning water at the time that they then tested by feeding it to guinea pigs and finding out back in 1968 that the guinea pigs were getting sick, okay? So they said, well, well enough alone. Uh, they tried to culture it, nothing much happened to it. They couldn't culture it, but it got known as Pontiac fever. When they went back and found the cause of Legionnaire's disease and knew that they had a problem with the water from that building. They went back to those blood sera from the people who got sick in this, and they essentially tested them for antibodies against Legionella pneumophila. And guess what? They were all seropositive to Legionella. 
So that's when we, and, and so the non-severe case of legionellosis is known as Pontiac fever, okay? And now that we can test for it and it's emerged, and basically the reason, as I mentioned, that it emerged finally, mostly had to do with the acquisition of air conditioning in the 60s and 70s, and then the idea that we had a cluster of sick old guys uh, enough to, uh, basically start a real investigation. Um, and because it was a Legionnaires convention, it got, the organism became Legionella, pneumophila, and the disease became Legionnaires disease. But I always like to see if suppose that didn't happen and, and this was still thought of a viral pneumonia and we really didn't know much about it, uh, what would happen had we discovered it 35 years later when in the Playboy Mansion in April of 2011, 170 people who all went to one of those wild parties that we see in movies, on many movies about these Playboy Mansion parties, uh, got sick and had Legionnaire's disease. And I always wonder what the name of that organism would have been uh, had it been first found uh, due to a Playboy uh, hot tub mention and you know maybe anybody want to shout out a, a good name for the organism uh, had it not been Legionnaire's disease? I guess not. Um, I always thought of it as being perhaps Hefnerella, uh, Playboyella, Pervertella, there's Provitella. Um, so you can, uh, anybody have any other names? Kibi is crying, I see. Okay, you can express your emotion with an emoji, it's up to you. All right, um, so here's what I want you to remember about Legionnaire's disease. It is a gram negative, hard to stain, thin, often motile, pleomorphic rod. This is important, often motile, okay? It's a facultative intracellular organism that in fact normally grows in an amoeba and it infects an amoeba called Acanthamoeba castellani, something you don't have to know, but you do have to remember that it grows normally in its normal host as amoeba, but it can also grow in macrophages. And one of the reasons it was missed for so long is that when you culture it on nutrient agar, which I'm gonna show you that you can do on special agar, Okay, it loses its virulence. It no longer will infect a guinea pig and cause a problem. So it was always discounted as being an important organism uh, early on until we had that Legionnaire's disease cluster. Okay, and intracellular or newly released uh, bacteria are in fact the virulent forms. Okay, and here, you can see the life cycle in the amoeba growing within a vesicle, multiplying within a vesicle, and then lysing that bacteria to release all these uh, bacteria. Lys sorry, lysing the amoeba to release all these bacteria, which then if they are in your, from a water supply that you've breathed in a water droplet and end up in your lungs can cause Legionnaire's disease. Okay, and here's a picture infecting a macrophage, same thing. They have this interesting type of phagosome coiling around the organism. Okay, you can see they grow to very high concentrations within a macrophage. And when they are released by a few, and they have a way of uh, evading the macrophage, which I won't go into, uh, but when they are released, uh, they're released in huge amounts and that basically induces a massive inflammatory response, which as we know, brings on that cytokine storm that brings on all the symptoms that then becomes lethal. Okay, lab identification now, of course, is with PCR, but we do have fluorescent antibodies. We can grow the organism. You see it growing on what's called BCYE. Agar doesn't really matter what that is. Uh, we can do serology, et cetera. Treatment, the important thing about treatment is you don't want to use penicillin for this. Why? Because penicillin doesn't go into macrophage as well, but erythromycin, Zithromax, Tetracycline, Cipro, 
all penetrate macrophages nicely and can be used to treat it. With that in mind, I think what we'll do is we'll take a short break for five minutes. Okay, and I'm going to pause. Oops, sorry. Um, I'm going to pause the recording. Um, uh, board, so we lost some people. Okay. Uh, it is 3.14, almost 3.15, so I'm going to start in a minute. Are there any questions? Okay, am I, am I on, oh, is my microphone on? Uh, let's see. You're good. Thank you very Thank you. much. All right, great. All right, let us continue on and talk about the next organism, which is Klebsiella pneumoniae. Okay, I want to point out that this was named after Edwin Klebs, who was a Swiss German microbiologist, one of the original microbe hunters who discovered the cause of diphtheria. And don't confuse him with one of the greatest James Bond villains of all time, Rosa Klebs, played by Lada Lenya. Okay, so Klebsiella pneumonia is now one of the first of those opportunistic organisms that I told you about. It is a gram-negative encapsulated rod. It is a member of the Enterobacteriaceae, so it's usually found in our gut. Uh, it is known to cause pneumonia, as I told you, uh, it, as well as urinary tract infections. It can be found in water. Uh, it's a fairly common microbe. Again, it's an opportunistic infection. Most of us see it at some point, but don't get infected by it. And most important thing to remember about this, like other Enterobacteriaceae, like E. coli and Salmonella, it is a facultative anaerobe. So it can basically grow under aerobic conditions, but under anaerobic conditions can also grow. And as a result, this turns out to be a common infective organism in an abscess because it can grow in that anaerobic pussy mess in a lungs. So lung abscesses that might come about due to the fact that you uh, essentially wall off the organism after it starts growing and it, you essentially have an infiltrate of liquid, of pus into it. It can grow in that anaerobic environment where there's no more air going in because the alveoli are destroyed. And so it's a frequent um, uh, contaminant and infective part of a lung abscess. And when that happens, if those lung abscesses ever break, which they do, um, now you release this organism all over the lungs and you have a gram negative sepsis producing organism that's highly fatal. So as a result, uh, 50, about 50% 50 of the cases that we see with Klebsiella are uh, fatal. Okay, you can see it's a gram negative mucoid lactose positive organism growing on McConkie's auger. Here it is a gram negative encapsulated organism. You can see the capsule. Uh, it also produces an LPS or an O antigen that we talked about. Uh, okay, and it's very painful to have a, you get chest pain with the lung axis. Uh, very often when, when you have an infection, it's doing a lot of tissue damage. So bloody sputum turns out to be a common uh, symptom of it. Um, and necrosis due to the, the abscess uh, and the toxins that the organism produces and uh, systemic uh, septicemia, uh, which as you know, is a highly lethal uh, 
infective state. As I mentioned, it's an opportunistic infection, very often secondary. It's all around us, this organism. Um, but it can in fact be isolated from the respiratory tract in about just under 5% of the general population. So it's there and people who are immunocompromised can get infected by it where it can cause a systemic infection. Okay, finding a little bit of it in a respiratory tract that's asymptomatic is not uncommon. Um, and we see about 10,000 cases per year uh, probably causing 5,000 deaths, okay? Mostly aged immunocompromised population. Uh, there are a bunch of other species of Klebsiella, so, but we're only talking about Klebsiella pneumoniae. These are also opportunistic infections. All right, um, that's all I really wanna say about Klebsiella. Just remember facultative anaerobe, Enterobacteria, gram negative encapsulated organism, and abscesses, lung abscesses, high lethality. It's all you need to remember. Okay, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, this is also an opportunistic pathogen, causes pneumonias and systemic infections. Mostly, we worry about that it can cause chronic infections in cystic fibrosis patients. Very often it grows in those thick mucosal secretions found in cystic fibrosis patients, okay? It is also uh, this organism because it has uh, so few growth requirements and will grow almost anywhere on any kind of media rather rapidly. Uh, it is a frequent cause of catheter related infections and respirator infect related infections. Uh, it can also grow uh, in the just outside your ear. It is a cause of swimmer's ear. Uh, again, it's ubiquitous organism, very easy to isolate Pseudomonas from the soil. Okay. Pseudomonas is a gram negative, oxidase positive, motile organism. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, it's extremely fast growing minimal growth requirements, and the colonies smell kind of fruity, okay? And sometimes they're blue. And most important, this organism produces biofilms, which is part of the problem, especially with cystic fibrosis patients, because these biofilms uh, essentially combine with at the mucosal to, to really mess up the air passageways of uh, somebody with them. Uh, Pseudomonas makes adhesins on their pili that uh, help bind receptors on epithelial cells and the flagella proteins uh, bind to airway mucins, not something you need to remember. Um, and as I mentioned, it produces a biofilm that essentially makes it very resistant to host defenses as well as screwing up the airways that biofilm is made uh, of a gelatinous polysaccharide. We've seen that before. Um, it's called alginate, okay? Probably because it had a slimy algae-like consistency, but it's also just referred to in the field as slime, alginate or slime, okay? Produce a number of toxins like ADB, ribot, rib ribosylases, endotoxins, gram-negative, et cetera, and exoenzyme S inhibits protein synthesis. So it's got a good ways of knowing how to poison uh, the uh, mammalian host, okay? Uh, it secretes proteases that uh, do damage to tissue, which helps it colonize, for example, but causes proteolytic necrotic destruction. So it's a pretty bad pathogen. Uh, and it does that because it, it's also a organism that's involved in uh, turnover of organic material in more wild uh, settings in the soil, et cetera. Okay, now what most people worries people about uh, Pseudomonas and its related organism is the fact, uh, is the airway problems that we talked about 
And there's a form, an organism that used to be called Pseudomonas, but now it's been reclassified and it's now called Burkholderia because it's more closely re resembles Burkholderia. Uh-oh, my, I think I lost, no, I can't answer. Um, am I still on? Yeah, you're good. We hear you and see you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, for a minute, my screen went blank. Um, okay. So Burkholderia is a pseudomonad. It still looks like a pseudomonas. It's a gram-negative modal organism. We'll hear about a couple of uh, other Burkholderia species in my next lecture. Um, this is really a more lethal form, a more lethal pseudomonad. Uh, especially in C cystic fibrosis patients, uh, just because it has a rather high fatality rate when somebody with CF actually catches a infection. It forms a biofilm, it's gram negative, and it's motile, just the way Pseudomonas is. And uh, I mentioned that over here, and next week I'll tell you more about Burkholderia malii and Pseudomalii, because these are zoonotic infections. Okay, that said, let us move on to a rather special class of pneumonias called walking pneumonias, uh, rather, rather less severe pneumonias, and really atypical pneumonias because these organisms are atypical, um, and again, not as severe. And what we're going to be talking about is the organism is mycoplasma. Okay, so it's called mycoplasmal pneumonia. <coughs> Basically, it's very common cause of ear infections, sore throats that can develop into bronchi bronchitis, and finally, uh, a low-grade walking pneumonia where you show a little bit of chest consolidation, uh, not much. Uh, maybe you can detect it via... Um, percussing, not usually, because it's not that severe. And people feel pretty crappy, okay, but not that crappy. And uh, you get fever, headache, malaise, probably a number of you have actually had walking pneumonia uh, due to mycoplasma. It's usually not diagnosed uh, properly, but uh, probably a number of you have actually had it. Uh, and uh, basically, it is partly due to its contagion, okay? It basically is a very cont common contagious organism, especially around army barracks and colleges, college dorms. So it runs through an entire dorm and everybody kind of gets sick and they may get swollen lymph nodes and everybody at first thinks that they all have mononucleosis, but then they, they actually, uh, find out that they have bronchopneumonia. Um, and you can see this diffuse. You don't see that hard consolidation that I showed you before. Um, and the diagnosis is usually based on the fact that it's not as severe. And if you give penicillin as a first line antibiotic to a somebody getting uh, having mycoplasma pneumonia, it's completely ineffective. So if after a day of penicillin, you don't get better, which is true if you're not immunocompromised um, and you have these, these, these symptoms, uh, one of the things being a dry cough is very, very indicative of a mycoplasma pneumonia, uh, you will essentially be put on a non-beta-lactam antibiotic. Okay, and you'll see why we don't use beta-lactam antibiotics in a minute. Um, we have about 2 million cases per year, representing about 100,000 hospitalizations. So it really is quite a, a uh, common disease. Interestingly enough, um, like other epidemics, it sort of goes up and down depending on the herd immunity of the population. Um, and that's because you become uh, immune to it if you get an asymptomatic or light symptomatic uh, infection for about five years. 
So that's why we see sort of these waves of it every five years or so going through the community, but it doesn't go down to zero. It's a, it's a suppressed wave as opposed to a wave like this of going from zero to a lot. Okay, uh, it's spread by droplets. Okay, as I mentioned, and essentially people get over it. Here are two patients uh, that we can see who clearly got over their walking pneumonia. Okay, why isn't it treatable by penicillin? And that's because this bacteria, mycoplasma pneumonia, completely lacks a cell wall. It does not have a peptidoglycan on it. It has a cell membrane and a cell membrane protein that acts like a cell wall, but it does not have a peptidoglycan cell wall that is the target for penicillin, okay? In addition, it also steals some sterols from you and puts that in the membrane, which if you recall my first lecture, sterols make membranes a little bit less osmosensitive. They make membranes a little bit stronger. And we can see that here. And that is mycoplasma, okay? No rigid cell wall, sterols, and it's a free living parasite. It's the smallest known bacteria. In fact, we used to think mycoplasma pneumonia was a viral disease because this bacteria is so small that it goes through those initial filters that I told you about, those diatomaceous earth filters. And, uh, but now that we have electron microscopy, et cetera, we know it's a bacteria. It's got a very small genome for, those interested, it was the first genome sequenced and the first genome actually synthesized artificially. Um, it's got very few genes, only about three or 400 genes. It's amazing how you can get a self-reproducing organism with only a few hundred genes, okay? And there are a number of other species of mycobacteria, uh, some that cause urinary tract infections and genitalia. Uh, these all cause urinary tract infections, genitalium, hominis, and ureal lyticum. But we're here talking about mycoplasma pneumonia. Here's another picture of it. Okay, and one of the reasons it causes a dry cough is that the organism, when it's in our airways, has this adhesion on it that enables it to sort of penetrate towards the epithelial, the ciliated epithelia in our airway, and it goes down here, binds to here, and essentially paralyzes those cilia. We have organisms infiltrating here, here, and here, uh, and it paralyzes the beating of that cilia, so we're not able to cough out uh, stuff, and our cough reflexes is, is stimulated, and as a result, you end up with this dry cough. You're not producing any mucus from it, uh, and so you have this dry cough, very important, okay? It evades the surface, the immune response with a variable surface antigen, uh, something you've heard about in other organisms. We'll talk about that a little bit next week as well. Okay, here's a little bit uh, cartoon of what the organism looks like um, with that adhesin at the tip. Okay, that protein's called P1. You don't have to memorize that. This is what I just told you. Okay, and in addition, it is also cap cap capable of producing a biofilm, okay, which helps it uh, stay away from the immune response uh, and from complement and other things that cause opsonization. And that biofilm can be seen when you grow that organism on agar shown here, here's that biofilm. And this, when you grow this organism, and this is often on the test, um, you have what's called the fried egg morphology of that bacterial culture due to that biofilm. Okay, diagnosis and identification uh, used to be done by fluorescent antibody, now do PCR for mycoplasma ribosomal genes. Uh, there used to be an old test called the serum cold agglutinin in test where the doctor at the bedside might take a, a blood sample, spin it down to get some blood serum, and then put that blood serum on ice and 
with mycoplasma infections about two thirds of the time, okay, uh, you, you would get that serum would under show precipitate, okay? But not only mycobacteria, not only mycoplasma do this, there are half a dozen bacteria that causes this cold serum a gluten in test. Uh, but it's an old nonspecific test that every so often uh, it might appear on an examination uh, that you might take at some point in your life. Um, treatment of mycoplasma, again, anything but penicillin, okay? Anything but penicillin. Okay, that is what I wanna say about mycoplasma. Now, I think what we will do is move on to everybody's favorite, favorite bacteria, chlamydia, okay? And we'll hear about why it's everybody's favorite after we hear about chlamydia and pneumonia, which we're probably not that familiar with, but chlamydia uh, can also can cause pneumonia, chlamydia pneumoniae uh, in particular. This causes another form of atypical or walking pneumonia. Again, most cases go undiagnosed. It's not that severe, okay? Uh, on the other hand, it can cause fever, sore throat, laryngitis. Again, non-productive cough, drive cough, rails. Those are the sounds uh, when you do auscultation through a stethoscope. You feel crappy, you can get a headache, uh, sometimes you can get a real bona fide pneumonia. Uh, sometimes it will give you a headache and a stiff neck first uh, as well. Okay. Um, it's actually thought to be more common than initially thought. Okay. Um, and everybody gets infected with it, is the bottom line. Basically, by 20, you're pretty much sure that you've seen it and you probably didn't get sick from it. Okay, what do we have to know about chlamydia? Okay, chlamydia is an obligate intracellular gram-negative energy organism. That means it cannot be cultured, okay? We do not know how to culture it, okay? We get chlamydia and the only way we can culture it is in a living organism or in a in tissue culture where it invades a cell and grows within a cell. That's because we think it's an energy parasite that it basically steals the ATP from its host cell as well as nucleotides and a lot of sw other small molecules, okay? Uh, it actually has does make a type three secretion system for injecting virulence factors into the cytoplasm, preparing that cell for infectivity. And most important, and this is super important, is that it has a biphasic life cycle in the sense that we see it in two form. We see it in the elementary body here, or the growing form, which is called the replicative or um, the replicative body um, shown here, which is the active metabolic form. So we think of the, um, the E form as being spore-like because that's what's going to be invade the tissue, okay? And then when it invades the tissue, it's going to differentiate into the replicative form or form where it's going to divide, okay? This organism, chlamydia, has a LPS on it. So we consider it sort of a gram-negative organism. Doesn't have a peptidoglycan cell wall. Instead, it has a cysteine-rich protein cell wall that does the same thing. And here is the inner cytoplasmic membrane. So it's rather different from all the bacteria we've learned uh, upon about so far, okay? Again, that biphasic life cycle with the EB form and the RB form, the replicative form is sometimes called the reticulate body. And the EB form is the elementary body or extracellular body or et cetera. And, and the RB is the larger form shown here. That's dividing. Okay, now, 
The way this organism works, and I call this the SpongeBob model of the chlamydia life cycle, is that the organism is endocytosed into the cell, into a phagosome that's membrane bound. It inhibits phagolysozyme fusion. So it's got itself a way of evading lysis from the lysosome, okay? And it essentially turns into the reticulate body or the replicative body and grows and divide many times. And then when it basically deprives its cell of its nutrients and ATP, it essentially, that vacuole moves to the surface and lyses the cell and sends out all those EB bodies that have re-differentiated from the RB cells into the extracellular matrix where they can then infect the adjacent cell. Now you may wonder, why do I call this the SpongeBob model? And that's very simple. When I first saw this, I couldn't help think of this guy. Uh, as a result, I'm the only one in the world who refers to it as the SpongeBob model. On the other hand, looking at it again um, and seeing SpongeBob merchandising, I discovered that there is a SpongeBob boxer short. So now I kind of think of this now as being maybe should be called the ugly boxer shorts model of chlamydial replication, okay? Diagnosis of this organism is by PCR or fluorescent antibodies, um, or we can find macrophages containing these inclusion bodies if we're lucky. Treatment is stuff that goes into cells like tetracycline and erythromycin. Penicillin is a lousy antibiotic for penetrating cells. So are sulfur drugs. Okay, now what do I have to say that's important about chlamydia? Okay, turns out that chlamydia is a very active area of research. And it's an active area of research because we might think that this has a huge problem with causing a lot of the problems as you get older, like heart disease and even Alzheimer's disease, um, because turns out that 60% of patients with heart disease have antibodies to chlamydia pneumoniae, as opposed to 20% of the normal population, okay? This is not causal, this is simply a correlation. People testing positive for chlamydia pneumonia antibodies had twice the amount of carotid artery thickening, which is associated with heart disease than the seronegative population, okay? Furthermore, diseased coronary arteries show electron microscopic evidence of some prior possibly chlamydia infection. So um, people think that perhaps the damage done by these organisms uh, during the life of a person may cause damage that in, brings on arterial diseases, okay? Finally, patients who are on long-term tetracycline or quinolones had a lower frequency of heart attacks, okay? And whereas people on long-term antibiotics that don't affect chlamydia like penicillin, okay, didn't have this effect, okay? So there is all this correlation uh, that people say are consistent with the idea that chlamydia infection may be the root, one of the important causes of Alzheimer's arth arthrosclerosis, inflammatory arthritis, okay? So these are theories, okay? The only problem with this is that since everybody has seen this organism at some point in their life, more or less, it becomes hard to pin it down. But we'll see if, if how model systems work uh, with respect to this in the near future. Okay, I'm gonna finish up with a couple of more talk about one other species of chlamydia, 
that you all probably know about, and that's chlamydia trachomata. So we're now going to leave respiratory infections because we're going to talk about chlamydia for a minute, and we're going to talk about how chlamydia is the most frequent cause of what we refer to as NGU or non-gonococcal urethritis. This is when it, it hurts to urinate and very often you have a pussy exudate coming out of uh, your urethra and your penis, et cetera, okay? Um, we think that it's much more of a cause of urethritis than gonorrhea uh, or Neisseria gonorrhea, okay? Um, and in women, uh, it can be a frequent cause of cervicitis, pulmonary inflammatory, uh, sorry, pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis, and may induce ectopic pregnancies, okay? And we diagnose this usually by exclusion, by eliminating all the other possibilities, showing that, it's, that there are no gram-negative diplococci indicative of the Neisseria infections, but we can also do PCR, a bunch of enzyme assays, fluorescent assays. And again, the treatment of non-gonococcal non urethritis is non-beta-lactam antibiotics. Usually we use some kind of protein synthesis inhibitor. Now the name chlamydia trachomatis comes from the fact that it causes a form of conjunctivitis known as trachoma, okay? And if you recall, I don't know how many of you like me have watched the movie, The Godfather at least 50 times, but in that scene where Don Corleone comes to Ellis Island, uh, you see the customs inspector on Ellis Island looking under everybody's eyelids uh, for infection. And what they were looking for was conjunctivitis usually due to trachoma, and they were looking in their eyes as well because uh, it can cause uh, all sort of blindness. And chlamydia is a highly infectious organism, usually by, by a droplets, by a, uh, airborne aerosols, or direct contact with bodily fluids, okay? Uh, hence, uh, that's what they were doing. Um, on the other hand, Don Corleone or Vito, uh, Vito Corleone, as he was called on Ellis Island, um, uh, essentially got quarantined for smallpox, not for trachoma. But what they were doing in the thing was they were looking under people's eyes because chlamydia causes mostly conjunctivitis that can get very bad and cause blindness, okay? And finally, one other strain of chlamydia called chlamydia cytokai, okay? This causes cytokosis, otherwise known as parrot fever or more properly ornithosis, okay? This is also spread by inhal inhaling bird products like feces or, or just being around any kind of bird uh, uh, secretions. Uh, it's the risk group for people who get it are poultry workers and pet shop employees. Uh, birds, it doesn't make birds sick, but this species of chlamydia can cause uh, a pneumonia, uh, which can be severe. Okay, but it can often be asymptomatic, like all the other diseases we spoke about today. It can go systemic and cause hepatitis and endocarditis. So it can be a severe pathogen, especially in immunocompromised people. Now, in the last 30 years, uh, the incidence of psittacosis has gone way down, and that's believed to be due to the fact that we treat our poultry feed with antibiotics. So next time you hear about how uh, the, our poultry, you know, you don't want to treat the poultry with antibiotics, um, and I'm not going to make a statement because I'm not an expert about it. One of the reasons for doing it was it did, maybe it does fatten the birds up a little bit, uh, but it actually did have the effect of reducing psittacosis in our population so that it's no longer a common disease. 
All right, it's now 10 to four. That I believe is all I have to say. Um, so we have an hour extra, uh, which I can take any kind of questions for, uh, or you're free to uh, sign off as you may be. And I'm gonna stop the recording once I know there are no more questions. So you can just shout out or put your hand up, et cetera. Um, Professor Kabak, yes. for Chlamydia, is it called Siddiqui? Siddiqui? Chlamydia Siddiqui, yes. Siddiqui. So for antibiotics, I, I didn't catch if you said if you could use any antibiotic. Any one that you could use on any of the other cl chlamydia species. You don't want one that doesn't go intracellularly. It is chlamydia and chlamydia grows only intracellularly. So if you remember well, that's one of the ones I said is penicillin is a lousy intracellular organism. I think sulfas are, sulfa drugs are kind of junky for that as well. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I'm stopping the recording.